Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 5th edition Vampire the Masquerade tabletop role-playing rules by World of Darkness. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. Listeners should know that this podcast is intended for a mature audience and will include strong language and mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and so forth, that may bear resemblance to entities living, dead, or undead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Rena Henze, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Old Ways podcast, Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle, Blood Moon Rising. I'd like to thank all of our listeners and our Patreon backers for all of your support for keeping this show going. This show would not be alive or undead without you, uh, so we greatly appreciate it. Uh, Tonight, we're going to be getting into some very uh, investigative shenanigans, perhaps. But first, we really need to do some introductions. So, to my right. Hi, this is Mike, and I play Marcus Voss of Clan Bruja, and I'm going to go to a club. Yes, Marcus has done a bit of clubbing tonight already, so we'll we'll see what the next uh, <laughs> next visit to the club brings. To Marcus's right. Hi, I'm John, and I'll be playing Vince Markovich, and uh, I am going to meet yet another powerful female vampire, and it's almost like this is just a through line in my life. Surprising how that happens. We are in the missing Rom the Shaman formation tonight. (laughs) So uh, at the end of the table, we have... This is Allie, and I play Katerina Bogdanovich, and I'm in trouble. Just just a little bit. I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine. Everything's okay. Nothing bad will happen to you. Maybe. And finally... This is Tiffany. I play Alex Giovanni, and uh, I'm also going clubbing. Funny how that works out. Well, we'll see what happens when you get to the club. But first, we're going to begin with our resident baby Tremere and our resident Toreador as they arrive in their Uber outside the home of one Phoebe Van Ness, the Tremere Whip, who Katarina has pulled some strings with to get Vince into their personal library. So your Uber pulls up outside this house. Katarina, as you're stepping out of the Uber, you get the text message on your pager uh, from the prince. And Vince, you have no idea this is going on. You're just looking at this nice, big, well, especially big for San Francisco standards, uh, colonial era home. Uh, It is painted a light blue uh, with white trimmings. It's got a really nice big front porch. This is a very gentrified area of San Francisco. And it's even more out there, fancy, nice, very obviously wealthy than where Karen lived. Karen tended to keep a low profile. It doesn't seem that Phoebe does. So you have been dropped off at two o'clock in the morning. What would you like to do? Uh, I'm going to look for an intercom or... (laughs) Anything like that that I can buzz myself? Yes, there is a gate and it's got one of those little pin pads where you put in a code kind of thing to open the gate, but also you can call if you push a button. So you push that button to call the house and there's a few seconds of just waiting there awkwardly as your Uber driver drives away behind you. And then you hear a Vince, that better be you. Speaking, speaking, Miss Van Ness. About goddamn time. And then you hear a bzzz, and the gate opens. Turns to, to Katarina as we've, after we're past the microphone, and he's just like, so this is going to go great, right? Like, I just have to be polite and um, not be an idiot, and it'll be fine. That is the short and long of it, yeah. But... Do the very best you can not to reveal what 
we're working on for the most part, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I was thinking probably better if she, if she knows about the Sabbat, though, about that little problem. This is very likely. One more thing. You have my pager number, yeah? Yeah. And would you call me another Uber? I have some other business I need to attend to. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Um, give me a second. <laughs> and he just does this really quick, knowing that he doesn't have time to fuck around. He's just like, da, 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 done. <laughs> Thank you. Page me when you are done. Yeah, of course. Okay, off you go. So, Vince, you would notice, because you're a San Francisco resident, the address that the Uber you called for Katerina is going to be going to somewhere near a certain theater where the prince tends to hang out. So I'm, I'm sure that's just a coincidence, but it, it, it's not exactly there, but it is in that district, which, you know, may be something to think about later. Happy coincidence. She, she wants to see a play, that's all. There's, there's a lots of things in downtown San Francisco. Not all of them are underground theaters. Exactly. So you leave Katerina on the sidewalk, Katerina, you wait about five minutes uh, before an Uber pulls up for you and you can get into the car and head off to your meeting. Vince, you have a very different sort of meeting as you go up to the front door of this ho- of this home. And before you can even knock or ring a bell or anything, the door swings open and there is a young person in an actual maid's outfit. Actual looks like a maid holding a feather duster in one hand and she looks at you and says, uh, Madame Van Ness will see you now. Please come in. Do not step on the carpet. I have just cleaned it. And she looks down disapprovingly at your shoes. I feel like it doesn't matter what shoes I was wearing. They'd still be disapproved. But Vince is wearing suit shoes. They're just not super nice ones. So he he steps in and he's just like, oh, of course. Sorry, sorry. Uh, don't mean to don't mean to be causing a mess. Um, the the maid closes the door uh, and puts her hands on her hips. She looks you up and down uh, and she just sort of sniffs. Huh. I suppose all sorts come here. Hm. This way. And she marches off down a hallway towards what you assume would be Phoebe's office. Th- this home is very elegant, right? Very well appointed. And it looks like the home of someone who's lived here for probably a century. It just looks very well lived in, but in a nice way. And it's very obviously full of full of books. Everywhere you look, there are books. There is a bookcase in each hallway. There are bookcases all over uh, the parlor as you poke your head in as you walk past. Th- this is very much a I live here and I read things and I don't do anything else sort of home, which perhaps resonates with you. And the maid stops outside a door and she raps quickly on, on the door and mutters something. You hear something from the other side, but you can't quite make out the words and you realize they're speaking French. And uh, the maid turns, looks at you. She taps you on the shoulder with her feather duster and says, you go in. I have things to do. Shoo, shoo. Vince is like, oh, okay. Um, and he he's kind of herded into the room more than anything else. Pretty much. So you're herded into the room and you see this massive office slash library. It is, it looks kind of like Karen's library or rather how it looked before the fire. There's these floor to ceiling bookcases all around the room, no windows. There's also a a cabinet of curiosities, you might call it. It's got glass windows and you can see through it. There's interesting little objects that perhaps you'd like to take a look at later, but not now, it wouldn't be appropriate. But there is a large mahogany desk, very antique desk, at the exact center of the room. And behind the desk is sitting a very elegant-looking woman. She's got 
very long blonde hair that is currently pulled up in an elegant updo. She's got deep blue eyes and she's wearing what some might call a power suit in a very light green and she's tapping a pencil lightly on an appointment book on the desk in front of her. Aha. So, Mr. Markovich, you finally deign to grace us with your presence. How marvelous. Miss Van Ness, I'm, I'm very sorry about the delay getting here. It's just that, um, well, my coterie and I have discovered some rather concerning evidence. And, uh, and he's, he's kind of like looking down and then looking at, flicking his eyes up and then looking down, flicking his eyes up. Well, speak up, child. Some of the older vampires say we have reason to believe that the coat that the Sabbat are active in San Francisco. Pencil was just coming down onto the appointment book again, and it just sort of freezes midair. And she locks eyes with you and tilts her head. Do you know what you are saying, child? I was given a, um, a truncated version of a series of events, uh, but I don't know all the details. Your sire, of course, did not instruct you properly. She stands up, slowly pushes her chair back, and she comes around to the other side of the desk. She sits on it, perches, crosses her arms across her chest, and looks at you, says, What do you mean the Sabbat might be active in San Francisco? They should all be in the Middle East. I haven't heard anything about a sabbat cell here. Speak up! Well, so Alex Giovanni of Clan Hecate and Ram the Shaman, the, um, they, they went on, they did some, something to do with the vision. I wasn't present and I wasn't given the details, but they're saying that the recent string of vampires, of, well, of vampire deaths are to do with, are to do with the sabbat. Her eyes narrow slightly, and that the pencil taps against her arm. I suppose it would take someone like them to take down Her Majesty. You see here a slight hint of sarcasm when she says Her Majesty. Just just a slight hint. Vince just bites his tongue. Very well. You've given me something to think about. And you are looking for something in my library to do what exactly with them? Well, we believe they've introduced some kind of toxin for vampires into the local drug supply. Given that most of us feed on drug users, um, it's, it's a very effective way of getting to us. Um and he, he just takes out the, the sheaves of paper and he's like, going through my sire's notes, I found uh, this ritual which she had been performing and some other notes as well. And and he like flips them open so she can see like the rough drawings. And, and he's just like, I believe she was taking it of the angle of an illness. Uh, this is from the medieval period. It was used to remove bubonic plague from kind blood. Now, I believe that what we are dealing with is a narcotic or some kind of chemical, um, perhaps a toxin for vampires. And I think that the concept is correct. It's just that it needs to be specifically attuned to work on that principle rather than rather than the idea of, a, of an illness which needs to be purged. She dismisses the papers you're handing out to her. Like, yes, of course I know that. I have that memorized, child. You don't need to explain our own clan history to me. Thank you very much. And her nostrils flare slightly. But what you are saying is interesting. Are you aware of your sire's extracurricular activities? And he kind of like hunches down a little bit and looks left and right. He's like, do you mean the uh, the blood cults? <laughs> uh, yes, the death cults. Uh. I wasn't until very recently. Quite. She didn't get well, me involved in all that, so he kind of just shrugs. She would use the kine and their devotion to, well, 
death and all sorts of things to sap their powers from their blood as they died. You can get quite a bit all at once. Just don't go looking up any pictures of Jonestown, that's all I'm going to say. So, makes sense she would be looking from that angle. I presume she had a murder dungeon. Quite common in these cases when you're doing some sort of experimentation. It's like, yep, she absolutely had a murder dungeon. Phoebe's tapping the pencil against her chin now. Well, that gives me an idea of what section of the library. Very well. She stands up, but before you can move, she just sort of locks eyes with you and she says, I want to go looking anywhere other than where I tell you to look, young Vincent, and don't be copying anything down without permission, or we might have problems. You don't have your sire around to protect you anymore, child. You're going to have to learn and grow up quickly. Vince gives a form, like a little stiff bow, and he's like, I appreciate you allowing me any access at all, Miss Van Ness. Very good. You're learning. And she smiles thinly, and it's not a very pleasant sight. You're already doing better than the last one, who is no longer with us. <laughs> yeah, Vince actually just says, oh. <laughs> Come along. And she sets off down the hallway. Her heels are clicking on the floor. She's wearing six-inch stilettos. Uh, just click, click, click on the floor, and it echoes. And you see uh, a door open off to the hallway, and a small child pokes their head out and smiles a very toothy, fanged smile at you before slamming the door shut. This way, Vincent. Don't dilly-dally. We have work to do. Yeah, and Vince kind of, like, power walks behind her. <laughs> she opens a, a door at the end of the hallway. It kind of blended into the wood. You almost didn't see it from where you were. And there is a staircase leading down, which might give you slight flashbacks to Karen's house, but you don't really have time to think about that right now because she is already starting down the stairs. And you follow her down this winding staircase. It's one of those metal staircases that curls around and around itself. And it's a little slippery, a little dangerous, but she navigates it in her stilettos with the ease of a gazelle. And you descend the staircase to find yourself in a basement library unlike any library you've ever seen. Karen had an amazing library in her home that you had visited several times, but it wasn't built up the way this one was. this one is. This is thousands of books. Some of them look newer, some of them look older. They seem to be very well categorized. You see labels sticking up in different places, which Karen was never very organized when it came to her books. They were just kind of on whatever shelf she shoved them on. And there's a reading desk. There's a whole separate little room for looking at books that are so old they shouldn't be opened in certain kinds of air or under certain kinds of light. Uh, it, it's just magnificent. It's like an archive down here. But you don't really have time to take it all in because Phoebe marches you over to one very specific section of the library in the back left corner. And she points to one bookcase full of tomes and says, here you go, this one. And she slowly, with great exaggeration, points to the books on this one case. This one. And Vince is just like nodding slowly. He's like, thank you again for allowing me access to your uh, to your sanctum. She smiles thinly and says, you'll be paying for it at some point. Don't forget. But yes. Now, let's get to work, shall we? and it appears she intends to assist you. Ooh. So we will leave the two Tremere's poring over books in a library, as one does, and we will turn our attention to one Alex Giovanni and one Marcus Voss as they go clubbing. I had a few things to do on the way. So um, I wanted to send my uh, little birds on their mess m mission and then uh, I got to make an appointment with Vera. 
On my way there, I am placing a phone call to the office and to one other gentleman to do a little cleanup work on the beach. And we'll um, we'll make every effort with um, our friends in transportation to gum up the works of anyone attempting to get to do any um, detailed forensic analysis of what happened. It's very easy to botch up a crime scene. It really is. So you put in a call to some of your underworld contacts. You give them the very specific location, as far as you can tell, based on Rom's uh, rambling description of where he was and where you think the gangrel territory might have started. And you also put in a call to one of your police contacts about uh, slowing down some things, perhaps. Absolutely. And then you can make a call to the office. There's a lot of pause before the phone gets answered. You're used to people picking up the phone immediately. Sure. Um, But it's a good 30 seconds of the phone ringing before you hear Marie's breathless voice on the other end. Hello, uh, Marcus? Yes, sorry, sorry. uh, What took so long? Someone got kidnapped outside our office. It's on the news, Marcus. There's cameras outside the office right now. Okay. I won't I wouldn't let them in, but they're they're there's crime scene tape outside the office. Hmm. Crime scene tape, huh? Okay. Well, we are a building that is not open to the public. And without a warrant, no one gets in. That's the law. That's what I told them. That they, I told them they can't come in. They need a warrant, and nothing possibly could have happened here. Whatever happens outside, that's their business. But bastards, Very... you're not required to explain anything to them. Let them knock. Let them ring the doorbell. Let them ring the phone off the hook if that's what they want. Let them waste their time. Yeah, that, that's what they're doing. I just had to get some of the others to calm down because they were freaking out you know the 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 new hires and the interns they were stressed out so that's why it took me so long to get to the phone do we know who's been kidnapped one of our union members okay Uh, do do you remember do you remember jimmy white and you know jimmy white he's a long uh he's a longshoreman um you don't know him know him but you know the name because he's on your roster Certainly. I, I'm not, I don't know who it is. I had to look up the name, uh, but he, he had a, a, a meeting in this area. He was, he was meeting someone according to my, my, my notes. He had a, he had a meeting. He was coming in on, on the floor below us to, to talk to someone. And apparently he disappeared and there's, there was some blood on the sidewalk and that's why the cops are here. Okay. The first thing I need you to do is calm down. It is never going to be good in a situation like this to get yourself so riled up that you can't think straight. You have to you have to do your best to ride that emotional wave. Right. Right. I'm so trying. We've had a member kidnapped. Jimmy's a longshoreman. So what I want you to do, if you haven't already, is place a call to his union lead. Either inform him that Jimmy has been kidnapped, if he doesn't know already, or gain whatever information you can from that lead about what they know. What was Jimmy doing? Who was he meeting? Why was he meeting? Get all that information. At some point, the media will leave. It will get boring to stand outside in the middle of the night and take pictures of a union building and a spot of blood on the ground, right? So, weather the storm, and I will be there as soon as I can be. Okay. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll call his lead, and she, you hear some scribbling. Like she's taking notes by hand. Sorry, it's, it's just been a lot in a week. <laughs> All right. I got this. Uh, did you need something? I assume that's why you were calling. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that... Uh... You were doing okay. And that the... I need a group of drivers. uh, Guys that are off routes. 
uh, or that are waiting for pickups in the morning, I need them to uh, park at a different place. I need them to park and I give her a couple of addresses uh, only in public spots. But um, if they've got to overlap, that's fine with me. Okay. Okay. You got it. I'll pull up the list and I'll make some calls. You've got this. I got this. Okay. I'll, I'll take care of that. I'll let you know as soon as as soon as I've confirmed everything. Do you want me to call you with what I get from Jimmy's lead or just... Just text me. Just text easier. you. Okay. Got it. It's going to be a long night. You'll be all right, Marie. I'll be there as soon as I can. Okay. Thanks, Marcus. You're welcome. I hang the phone up and then like curse as I'm driving. We really... I don't... The Union Hall does not need any direct attention right now. We're doing too many things. Yes, but it's unavoidable at the moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine, though. So, Alex, uh, you paid your birds a visit. Did you uh, Did you go to their apartments? Did you call them? Um, I probably called them and then gave them their assignments. Okay, so you called in your little information network and gave them some very specific things to look into, which yes. we will get into later. Do you tell anyone that Maxine is dead? I probably talk to Eddie, but he's probably the only one that I would tell. Okay. So Eddie sounds really upset when you pass the message on to him. Is, uh, do, do you want me to go over there? Um, did you feed the cat? No, but it's your gonna get sick if you go um okay okay i I guess uh i mean the best you can do if you want to save her cat is maybe you'll crack the door open and see if he'll come out but i mean the best i would say is maybe call uh the authorities and uh have them do a welfare check because you haven't heard from her yeah, uh, I I don't even need to do that. I can just I can put a flag in on her address, and you hear some typing in the background. Like I can get them to just go in without me having even to do anything, talking to anyone. Right. Okay. Um, did you need anything else? Uh, no, I told her to stay away from that garbage. Oh, also, uh, actually, there is some stories coming out about uh, some attack on the beach. Oh, yeah, the the crawler. Yeah, it's in the tabloids already. Yeah, can we suppress some of that? I mean, I can try. It's like 911 call, prowler serial killer on the beach, that kind of thing. Well, I mean, the tabloids are the tabloids. Nobody's going to believe that garbage. But anything that's trying to get into actual media, if we can suppress that, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Um... I'll put out a flag on the police records to see if anything comes up, and I'll make sure that they don't talk to any journalists about it. Okay, thank you. I can change a few details, or if you'd prefer to go that route and make it a completely different story, just let me know what you want. I got you. I mean, basically, I want it to sound as unbelievable as possible. So. He snickers. That shouldn't be hard. (laughs) Right, exactly. Like, I heard the call, man. Like, whew. It sounded like crazy talk. I don't think anyone's going to believe it anyway. Yeah, I'm thinking people are getting a hold of the stuff that Maxine did, which is not good. Oh. Oh. He gets serious again. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of that. Just just let me know if you need anything else. Um, I'll, I'll let you know when the cops show up to check on Maxine. Um, but ju- just you might want to stay away from this building for a bit. Just That's the plan. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, after the police go, uh, have been through and, you know, it, her, she gets cleaned up. Um, if you can maybe grab a few things that were important to her, I will want those later. Important? Okay. Yes. I mean, I can get like her laptop and the cat. No, I mean, things that were send- sentimental to her. Oh. Okay, that shouldn't be too hard. Yep, I'll, I'll let you know what I get. All right, thank you. And then I will, yeah, make an appointment with Vera if I can. 
that's not too difficult to do. You get through, you've called before, so they have your number. And Paula tells you that uh, Vera is out at the moment with a visitor, but that she has an appointment for the following evening. She has some space on her calendar. Uh, and if that works for you, you can you can come by and meet with Vera. Okay, sounds good. And so that's easily taken care of and, you know, family business, not too hard. Mm -hmm. And you can head off to the Blue Orchid. So I imagine Alex gets there first since they've been there multiple times. And also uh, they have a nicer car, (laughs) but it doesn't take too much longer for Marcus to pull up into parking in the same parking lot. So the club is still active tonight even without Trevor there which is a little surprising to oh, you. Oh no, Trevor might be there. Well, he might be but to you as a person Alex, you're a yes. little <laughs> you're a little taken aback by the fact that you know Trevor's not there but you still hear music this time it's jazz coming from the uh, coming from the doors of this club and the normal bouncers are standing outside I will uh nod to them he with you they tilt their head towards Marcus oh yeah yeah he's helping me out with something you seen the boss no I was just gonna ask you the same thing is Sammy here Sammy and he looks at the other one like I haven't seen him tonight although he might have come in the back entrance Okay. I gotta find Sammy. Well, and Trevor for that much. Well, Tr- Trevor ain't here. Uh, we, w- we would know if he was here. And they just sort of smirk. Who's running the club tonight? Eli. Oh, really? Yeah, came in, said he had uh, orders to keep things open and running because the boss had some other stuff going on and... He, he, he's not doing any business or anything. He just told us to open up and get the music going and get the kids in, you know. Hold on. But you haven't heard from Trevor directly. The two bouncers look at each other. No, but he had Trevor's card. Really? Okay, when has Trevor worked with Gangrel? I mean... They look kind of lost for words. These two big burly meatheads just look kind of lost for words. Like, stranger things have happened. Uh, In what decade? Well, the boss had him bringing in stuff, so we... And they just start scratching their heads. You better hope Trevor doesn't show up tonight. I gotta go find Sammy. And as we start walking in, I look over at Marcus. Like... What the hell? (laughs) Strange bedfellows. Well, I mean, I guess we don't have to look for Eli, so there's there's that. I assume he's probably in Trevor's office. So I'm going to head towards the back like I normally do. You go through the main dance floor and past the bar to the office, Marcus. The lighting in here is, as you would expect from the name, uh, very blue. Right? This... The lights are all this dark covered glass. They give off this blue light. Uh, It's very kind of haze inducing, almost you'd say. Uh, There's some classic jazz playing uh, a jazz band up at the front. There's only a few vampire couples in here and you definitely see some very young looking mortals who are giggling and falling over themselves. Uh, as they try to dance with their kindred partners. Uh, And in a back corner, you see a Ventru uh, who has a young human woman on his lap. Uh, She's wearing next to nothing. And she's laughing in a slow sort of drugged trance as he is sinking his teeth into her neck. It's like one big trope. I mean, pretty much. Uh, so this is Trevor's club? Yes. Well, it, it technically it was his 
Sawyer's Club. Mm. He ran it most of the time. But the money, you know where the money came from. I'd assume the clan. Yeah, mostly. So you go back behind the bar and the bartender gives you a wave. Alex, uh, he's polishing up some very fancy looking bottles of alcohol and putting them on a shelf. Uh, But outside the door to Trevor's office, there is a very massive looking vampire standing there with their arms crossed over their chest and they are standing in front of the door. I'm just going to walk up and like no expression, no anything, go, you're new. What do you want? To see Trevor and to see Sammy. Hmm. Don't know those names. Oh, really? Because Trevor owns this club and Sammy helps run it as well. They just sort of shrug their burly shoulders. I'm not with the club. Let me guess you're with Eli? Slow nod. Great. So Eli is in Trevor's office, is what you're telling me. Could be. Great. Uh, How about you tell Eli that he has visitors and see if he can track down Sammy? Do I look like a messenger boy? Well, I'm assuming you're not going to let me go in there, correct? Nope. Okay, so then yes. Yes, you do. Name? Alex. That one. Bruno. He just looks at both of you, tilts his head slightly, stay here. And the door opens and his bulk is so massive, you can't quite see past him to into the room. This is a solid mountain of a man. Yeah, I was going to say, as soon as he turns his back to us, I'm going to turn to the bartender, because I'm assuming the bar's pretty close to, like, the office door or whatever. It is, yeah. And go, and, like, give him, like, the look of, like, what the hell is this? The bartender shrugs as the bodyguard closes the door behind him. And, uh, he just goes, uh, I don't know. It's been a bit weird the last couple nights, honestly. That one, and he points with his thumb back towards the door, been coming in, keeping things going for a couple nights, saying we have to keep business as usual. But I ain't seen the boss around. And he looks at you, Marcus, and gives you a smile. Says, haven't seen you around before. Nope. Not my sort of place. Yes, well... We go where we have to. He smiles. It, it's it's been a little odd around here. I was just going to ask, how are people acting? Well, people with quotes. <laughs> well, there's not last night not as many. Tonight even fewer. And he gestures out towards the mostly empty hall. That's why we got the jazz in, jazz band in. We couldn't get our normal groups. Too many people not feeling well. Hmm. Interesting. What about yes. Sammy? Have you seen him? Nope. He hasn't been around for a couple nights. Actually, I haven't seen him since the night after the boss left. Come to think of it, he scratches his head. Huh. Yeah, he hasn't been around. That's weird. Guess I didn't think about it with that mm. one here. Have you seen the boss? It's been... A little while. Well, I was guessing with his uh, sire, and he puts a hand over his chest and bows his head slightly. With his sire no longer with us, I assumed, I guess we all assumed he'd need a few nights to himself, but haven't heard anything at all for the last two or three, which is a little strange. Clan's been asking. Yeah, I figured he'd show up here. It's part of the reason why I'm here. You know, we can't stay too far away from here. Yeah. I mean, he looks to the side and he leans in like he's he's starts pouring out drinks for both of you to make it look like he's just attending to customers. And he leans in and he says, you know, between 
you and me. Well, this isn't like him. I mean, he was a bit of a gad about town and a dandy and all those sorts of things. And he smirks slightly, but who of us isn't uh, in Ventru? And uh, normally he'd do his dalliances here, though, because he'd at least keep an eye on things. And so we're used to him being a bit of a flake. Don't tell anyone I use that word. But... But it's true. Yes. But he's a flake here. Even if we can't get to him because he's too busy with some mortal he's draining dry. At least he's here. Right. And if the clan calls, if the whip calls, he's here. But he hasn't been here. I know that he mentioned he wasn't feeling well as well, but it's been, yeah, it's been a little while. So I figured, well, I needed to talk to Sammy about a few things and I figured Trevor might have rolled in here. Nope. He shoves a glass of beverage over to you, Marcus. On the house. Not too busy tonight anyway. But no, we we haven't seen Sammy. Just got that gangrel coming in, acting like he owns everything. Also, as a word of ca- of caution, I would stay away from the food here. Both eyebrows go up. I push the drink back just slightly. Especially since you haven't seen Sammy. All right. I don't eat the merchandise anyway. I mean... Between you and me, the druggies don't like the taste. Gives you a weird sort of buzz. Mm, Sometimes, yeah. But it's, it's, it's not good right now. So, as a piece of free advice. He clasps his hands over his chest. Free advice from Alex Giovanni? What a night! He smiles. As the, as the door behind the bar opens and the mountain comes out again. Thanks for the drinks. You got it. Don't be a stranger. And I'll look over at the cereal crusher. The, the mountain just sort of stares down at both of you. Sammy's not here. Okay, well, uh, and what? Eli's not willing to speak with us? He wants to know why. Because we're concerned for Trevor? You know, the owner of the club? The mountain shrugs. Well, you can tell him that's why. Go on. Go on, shoo. The door opens and he sticks his head in and he yells something in an unfamiliar language to you. Uh, And you hear someone responding in the same language. And he comes back out, closes the door. Five minutes. Okay. And he steps to the side and opens the door. And he looks at both of you and then especially at you, Marcus, and says, no trouble. You're right. It won't be any trouble at all. Hmm. And the door slams shut behind you and he's standing outside the door. I'm immensely grateful I have a bruja with me today. (laughs) As you go into this office, uh, you see the low, familiar furniture, Alex, that you're used to meeting with Trevor on this sort of crushed blue velvet couches and everything. But the occupant of the office is different this time. You see a tall, lanky looking man. He's got very deep set green eyes and a shock of red hair. He looks a bit like a walking scarecrow and he looks to be probably about six foot five as far as you can tell from him seated and most of it is his legs and he's wearing a conservative dark suit the only concession uh, to where he is is on his tie he has what looks like an, an emerald tie clip it is the only bit of color about his outfit and he is just leaning back in the chair, hands behind his head in a state of relaxation. 
And he looks up at the two of you as you come in. He goes, Ah, Giovanni. And is that Marcus Voss I see? I was wondering when you'd come pay me a visit. And we'll come back to you in a moment. So, Vince, you have been wandering around, metaphorically speaking, the centuries, uh, as you've been reading through various tomes and texts that Phoebe has passed to you. Currently, the two of you are sit- sitting at one of these tables in that room that was glassed off to prevent damage to certain books. And Phoebe is pulling on a pair um, of gloves and she is setting a book out on the table under a special lamp so that the two of you can look at it. Is, uh, Miss Vaness, is there anything I can do to assist or uh, I can carry things? I, He's like, I, I've never actually held books this old, but... Yes, you're not going to touch them today either. Sit. And she points at a chair uh, to her left so that you can see the book, but uh, you're not touching it. All right, so I think this might be what we're looking for. I think. Uh, and she starts muttering something to herself in what sounds like Latin, based on what you remember from medical school, but also from the few things that Karen taught you. Uh, and she starts muttering something to herself uh, as she's looking through sections. It's been so long since I through this. Uh, Oh, Vincent. And she reaches across the table and grabs another book and hands it to you. This is the companion journal to this one. Uh, Why don't you have a look through that and we'll see if they they line up. And so she's going to give you this book. It's not as old as the one she's looking at. It's definitely older. Uh, but it's a green leather bound book um, and it appears to be a handwritten text not printed Um, so you can have a look through there and I'm going to have you give me a roll for this to see what you find so give me give me occult plus intelligence see what all you pick up from this tome as the two of you are working together. And I'm going to lower the difficulty because Phoebe is working with you. So you're going to need four successes here instead of five. Two out of five. Can I interest you in spending a willpower point? You absolutely can. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So mark off a willpower point on your character sheet and you can (laughs) re-roll. Bestial failure. Oh, no. <laughs> How embarrassing. Um, I, I had one thing to do when I came into this building, and it was not embarrass myself. So, here's what's going to happen. So, you're looking through this text, and you hear Phoebe muttering in Latin to herself as she's reading the companion book next to you. And you're flipping through the book and you see some odd sketches and various other things you don't really want to think about because they remind you too much of what you saw at Karen's home. But you can't not think about them. And as you look through this final section that you come to where it seems to be talking specifically about as far as you could tell it, it's a documentation of sorts of a time about 400 years ago where someone was attempting to filter out undesirable elements from blood not just illnesses like what Karen was working with this this appears to be something something meant for making food more palatable to vampires and filtering out imperfections. Uh, And, okay, that sounds about right, and you keep reading, and it's the same vampire, it appears, journaling about their experiments, and you find a very disturbing note labeled 1939, where this same vampire is talking about removing genetic impurities from blood. 
And that makes you feel very uncomfortable as you're reading that. And you start to realize who wrote this journal and that's the person you're in the room with and that makes you very very uncomfortable and you keep reading and you're trying to push these thoughts away and away and away but you you keep slipping her a bit of side eye as you're looking at this blonde blue-eyed vampire you're looking back at her notes and you're looking back at her and you're kind of distracted Vince you're you're not really thinking about your original mission here as she's muttering to herself you are completely distracted by the fact that um where did she come from exactly you mean I'm distracted by the fact that I'm trapped in a small room with one of the vampire women of the Third Reich's SS. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes, that, that that occurs to you. And I think, Vince, with this bestial failure, what's going to happen is you're going to gain a compulsion. And your compulsion is going to be finding out the history of every vampire you come in contact with. Because... You can't trust anyone anymore, Vince. You're you're developing some paranoia here. Karen was the Queen of England. Like, she never told you that. And and now you have a vampire Nazi that you're in the room with, and she you came to her to talk about blood purification. And Jesus fuck. Who, who's your coterie? Who knows what horrible things they do or did or were? And so your compulsion now, Vince, um, is a paranoid obsession with finding out the dark secrets of every vampire you come in contact with. I feel like this is going to be an awful lot of work, but it's going to be worth it. Yeah, no, he's just like, yes, this this this, uh, this notebook is uh, very... Well, the, the experiments are in depth, but I mean... Some of the ideas are pretty fucking stupid. Do you say that to her? He's like, yeah, no, I mean, some of it's like, it's it's just, even at the time it was outdated, you know, it's bizarre. Whoever wrote this was clearly some kind of lunatic. So you say that, and there is a long, silent pause. She's holding one page of this old book in her gloved hand as she's turning the page. And she turns her head and she looks at you. Now, now, child. Is that a way to speak to your elder and better? And he's just blinking at her. He's just like, there, there was no data to support any of this. This is just knowing that it was, there was nothing to support any of it. So let me get this straight, Vincent. You, a three-year-old kindred, with no history, no family, and now no sire, with no understanding of the etiquette and the rules that bind us, you, Vincent Markovich, are presuming to tell me, your clan whip, 437 years old. I have forgotten more than you've ever learned in your life, child. You presume to tell me what is right and what is provable. You know what we did to people like you? My surname is Markovich. I'm pretty sure I know what you did to people like me. Quite. And while I may have put those ways behind me, for now, don't think I can't make you disappear, child. Your sire's gone. No one would ever notice you. We're missing. 
You're a nurse. You are a child, a youth. You are unremarkable, Vincent. No one would miss you if you were gone. And and she tilts her head and arches her back slightly, and she sniffs. Your sire, though, was powerful. And your vitae contains the strain of hers. Just think of what I could do with your blood, Vince. Now tell me why I shouldn't take every last drop of it right this minute. And we're going to leave you there for the moment. Okay, so, Katarina, you have a summons to answer, do you not? I do. I have to go see the prince. Yes, nothing ominous about that whatsoever. But you are here, and it's a little bit different from the last time. You know, the last time you came here, you just dropped off a note with the bouncer at the front, uh, or the bodyguard, you're not sure which. But as you come up this time, there is uh, Jean Valentine, the Seneschal, who you remember meeting at Luther's. Yep. And she is waiting for you at the door. And she just sort of looks at you. She looks she looks tired, as much as a vampire can be tired. And she looks like she's been running around doing a variety of things. Her usually immaculate eyeliner is a little smudged. And she looks like maybe she's been wearing the same clothes for a couple days, which is very strange for a Seneschal. But she just sort of opens the door and waves you and goes, come on, hurry up, hurry up. We don't have all night. Come on. Yeah, I won't uh, dilly-dally. I'll go right in. So she ushers you in. Uh, this time, instead of taking you to the green room or the stage, uh, she takes you back to a door that has a star on it, usually for the leading person in a production. She raps on the door three or four times. And from within, you hear the unmistakable voice of the prince say, Katerina Bogdanovich, bienvenido. Come. I will open the door. So inside is a room you haven't seen before, Katerina. This is a nice, well-appointed room, very tasteful. It obviously is a dressing room, so you see a bunch of costumes and things, but there is a very fancy-looking chair in the middle of it. And the prince is seated on the chair. Their fingers are lightly tapping on the armrest. Uh, and Jean just opens the door wide. And you notice, Katarina, that Jean has no reflection in the mirror before she quickly slams the door shut and leaves you alone with the prince. Good evening. And I will bow. On any other day, that would make the prince just the sheer... Um, deference would please the prince, but much like the usher that brought you into the room, the prince looks displaced. They are not doing well. Um, usually there is an aura of power that just completely radiates off of the dead flesh, and right now you're seeing that at maybe a 25, 30% capacity. They look exhausted, they look tired, and the way that their fingers are both tapping and then turning to curl pulling, you know, that wood beneath their fingernails, you can see that they are extremely on edge. That aura of audacity and power is more like a residue type of situation right now. Um, they look at you and they say, Katerina Bogdanovich, we are overdue for a debriefing, I think. So there has been significant developments. Um, First things first, apparently um, one of the coterie has found that what is happening to the people who have been perishing is that it is a new type of drug that is being dispensed through some of the product in the farm. So people are getting infected from my bakery and 
I am very displeased with this, so I'm going to be going to the farm and... Well, people are going to probably have to report to you and lose a head, I'm hoping. Outside of that, there is the possibility that with our young Tremere working with the Tremere whip, we will be able to have him conduct a ritual that will purify the blood and vitae of kindred based on some old rituals but it was Alex Giovanni that prevented me from reporting on time so I was hoping to beseech you in making Alex Giovanni owe the Tremere whip a favor because of the delay you're asking us to make Ajax Giovanni more liable or compliant? More compliant and also simply the matter is of such urgency that the longer it takes to do the research, the more people who might die. They glare at you. It's a very cold, hard glare. And you get that impression again that there's something inside of the princess trying to claw its way out through its eyes. And they go, this can be arranged with no small amount of pleasure on my end. Continue. The last important thing is that there are too many people, too many of our kindred that are aware of my Kotori doing this work for you, my prince. The Malkavian... Mm. They groan. The Malkavian told another of his clan and as a result all of the Malkavian know and that has become more spread. I have been asked questions about whether or not we are doing your bidding and it is inconvenient for all parties involved. Inconvenient would be an understatement. Were you there at the poetry night when our Malcanviano appeared? No, I found out about it through Vera Giovanni. And what did Giovanni tell you? It is a very interesting report that I've received from another. Avada Giovanni asked if I was close with you and that she had heard from someone else in the clan that I was close and as a result there was only one way that they could know. And that is if our Malkavian in the Kotori had talked about it. Katharina, humor me. Were our instructions not clear that mm, we require discretion? Yes, they were very clear. I did not think that a kindred who has been around for a decade would be so careless. But I will keep an eye on him as well. I berated him severely because of it as well. And they seem to be mildly amused by the fact that you are berating them. Yes, from my report, Ram the Shaman, and they say this with like a slither of distaste, walked into a bar full of psychics and oracles and in their own stupid old hubris made the statement I am on very important business from the prince. Let me read you a poem about it. Yes, I was not aware and they did not disclose that this was a problem. He has been problematic in general so I will be keeping an eye on him as I will be keeping an eye on Alex Giovanni because of everything that he has done 
Su ojo son muy ocupado, Katharina. So many eyes, so much babysitting. Yes, I was not expecting to need to divide so much of my attention from what you requested of me, but I believe it is absolutely necessary to keep an eye on Ram the Shaman as well because he also drained someone and did not take care of his, the body of it. You are becoming very distracted, Katarina Bogdanovich, due to the babysitting of your coterie. We will assist in your pursuit of clarity. We will lean on those that continue to distract you from this mission. Too much is at stake. Cannot have, we cannot have these instances of foolery. I understand, my prince. What I need more than anything is someone to keep watch over Ram the Shaman because Alex Giovanni is potentially more of a problem. And I will be actively rooting out whoever is tainting my business and tainting the kindred because I will not stand for it. No, nor should you. Katarina, you know of this hammer that is coming from Chicago? Yes, of course, my prince. We have been made aware. This one says he is coming to resolve Ventru business after the death of that Pendejo Anrad. But we are aware that he is coming to look into us. We ask you, Katarina, as our loyal subject, to report back to us what this William Mallet says should he summon you into his presence, which we are certain that he will. You know that I will. The moment I am able. Bueno. Very well. That is all. My prince, if I may have a moment of your time, I have a request to ask of you. You may ask. Vera Giovanni of Clan Tremere is a personal friend. Hmm. Her father has just died. I ask that you grant her leave to go to Italy to see her family again. Very well. If you wish it, she may go. But we ask a favor in return. Thank you, Your Excellency. What may I do for you? Your primogen, Claudio. He attempted the most heinous crimes. He plotted to give us, your prince, a true death. For this, we have cast him out. But tonight, we declare the blood hunt. We wish for you, Katarina Bogdanovich, to assist in this hunt. And... Should you be the one to take this worthless worm's life, we give you our blessing to take his soul as a reward. As you wish, my prince. I will do what I can. See? You will. You may go. And do not wait so long in the future to appraise us of the events of our city. Now we are going to go back to the club where... Alex and Marcus were having a visit with Eli the Gangrel. So Alex and Marcus, you were in the office with Eli. The mountain is standing outside the door. Even though the door is closed, you can still sort of feel the looming presence. Uh, and Eli looks very casual, very relaxed in his dark suit as he's just sort of looking at the two of you. <gasps> Thank you. For coming by. It's about time you showed up. I've been here three nights waiting for you. Oh, really? Oh, I. The boss is missing. Perfect time for me, which means the right time for you two to make an appearance. <laughs> Considering you didn't work for him that long... You know, Lisa just mysteriously went missing and you mysteriously showed up. 
I merely took advantage of a wonderful opportunity. Hmm. What can I say? Wherever Messy Sanderson is, I'm sure she is fine. Mm-hmm. But the product had to be moved, and they needed someone to move it. And well, miraculously, here I was. And uh, where's Sammy? Sammy? He shrugs. Who knows where he is? He was always a bit of a, well, like the boss. He was always a bit of a flake. I'm sure he is fine. Really? Because, uh, I, uh, I found him to be way more responsible than Trevor in a lot of situations. (laughs) It doesn't take much to be more responsible than Trevor fucking Conrad. Which... Which Ventru gave you the rights to the club then? Was it the Whip? Was it the Primogen? Was it somebody else in the Conrad line? The Conrad line? Well, you know Trevor is the only one of them left. Now, isn't he? After the Second Inquisition? Perhaps that's what they've told us. Yes, well, (laughs) I can tell you for sure he's the only one. Assuming he's still around. Anyway, I hear he hasn't been feeling too well of late. I heard that as well. Mm, Strange, isn't it? We don't really not feel well. Unless we're hungry. But so many of our kind are just not feeling up to things. Reminds you of the mortals last year. Doesn't it? Calling in sick, got a wee bit of a cold. No one knows the long term effects. <laughs> How long have you known? How long have I what? How long have you known? No what exactly? You'll forgive me, but I step closer. No, I won't forgive you. Answer my question. How long have you known? He sits up a little bit straighter, and there's a kind of reptilian sort of gleam to his eyes Mm. as you get closer to him. See, the thing is, I know a lot of things, Marcus. Quite a lot of things, in fact. So you can't just ask me, what do you know, without being specific? It would be like me asking your Giovanni friend there if they'd spoken to any dead things lately. Okay, let me clear it up for you because I don't have fucking time for this. How many would you like? Now there we go again with the hinting and not saying exactly what we mean. How many would you like? How many teeth would you like to leave the room with? Or should I just take the whole head? Oh... Is that how we're going to be doing things? If I don't get my answers quickly, it's absolutely what I'll do. Because as far as the club is considered, you don't own it. And if you know why vampires are getting sick, the conversation is going to get real short, real quick. Ah, now we finally get to business. I appreciate that about you, Bruria. Always very unsubtle. Have we seen Esmeralda around recently? We must have a wee chat about her predecessor, poor little Luther. And he smiles. You see, like long, sharp, almost, almost snake fang-like teeth emerging from his jaw. Well, I do know some things, I suppose. But you know, I don't take kindly to threats. Especially not from you, Bruya. Oh. Tell me, where did the Bruja clan hurt you? 
Show me on the doll where we touched you. His tongue flicks out, it, and you can see it sort of splitting in the middle a bit as he licks his lips. That's the thing, Marcus. Luther was always very good to you, Rabble, wasn't he? Not what we were hoping for when one of our own finally got elevated to sheriff all those years ago. Finally, we thought, someone would put down all those animals in town, and yet here you are. I've heard he even lets you fight alongside him. He let me? He let me? You need a history lesson. The tongue flicks out again. Do I? Hmm. Yeah. Luther and I crossed paths a few times. And as far as his elevation as sheriff, that's purely the prince's job. Not mine. In fact, for the most part, Luther and I got along fairly well. Yes, that's part of the problem. Not for me. Was it a problem for you? Uh, his head is m- slowly moving back and forth. Almost almost like he's moving to some kind of song or rhythm that only he can hear. Mm-hmm. Well, some of us aren't been too happy with the way things were run around here. Haven't been in some time. And as to this not being my clan's club, looks to me like it's mine now. Ventrue's in disarray. No one's seen Trevor. Felix is gone. And so many have been dreaming. Haven't you heard? They are in no position to do anything. So, to the Vector goes the spoils. Well, you haven't fought for it at all. So it seems a bit of a false victory. Oh, haven't I? It is kind of a coward's move. Yes, I have fought. You were on the other side, Marcus. The war. I always would have considered it a pleasure to encounter you personally, Scourge. But alas, it was not to be. Uh, and his he's no longer blinking normally. His, he's blinking side to side, and his eyes are turning yellow. We're right here. So we are. And if you were on the other side during the war, that means that you're a member of the Sabbat. And therefore, food. And I, when I say food, I'm going to use all four dice of intimidation. Oh my. Because I take the spot very seriously. And I kind of get the look of, oh yeah, nice. All right, so give me that intimidation. Certainly. And he's going to contest that. As he should. With his resolve. As he should. I have three. Although, yeah, no, I'll leave it. I'll leave my power aside. How many did you get? I have three. Okay. So he got a bestial failure. <laughs> nice. So, yes, uh, the dice are not kind to anyone today apparently, other than Marcus. Um, so you see as you as you glare down at him and you put all of the force of your anger into saying the word food, his body shivers and you see he starts to change. And you okay. see these scales begin rapidly overlapping over his body as his limbs fuse with the rest of him into this long, long, snaky reptilian body. Mm -hmm. And the tongue is flickering and flickering and you see that his head flattens out and his ears slide to the side. It looks like he's got a hood almost this snaky cobra hood as he completely 
loses composure and transforms into a cobra. Yeah, I don't think I feel, I don't feel caught cowed at all by his transformation into a snake. Because no matter how many times a snake, a snake sheds its skin, it's still a snake. And, uh, and therefore can be dealt with in, you know, various ways. Um, having fought alongside several Gangrel in uh, a few decades ago, I've seen Protean used uh, more than a few times. He just prefers to snakes. That's fine. So I'll look at, at Alex and uh, raise an eyebrow. I will uh, yawn and look bored. This cobra is going to spit venom at your face, Marcus. Okay. So we are going into combat for the first time in our in our chronicle. Mm, fantastic. So I think what I would rather do is, seeing that he is spitting at me, my my goal will be to leap around such an attack, right? To literally okay. vault myself forward. And uh, engage him in a headlock. Okay. Uh, so you're going to attempt to grapple. Yeah. Uh, so in that case, you're going to give me strength plus your brawl. Certainly. I have a specialization in bar uh, fights. Not with snakes. <laughs> yes, you do. But, <laughs> but, but you're, in, you're in a bar and it's a fight. Correct. True. 100%. So he is going to roll for his venom. Holy shit. One, two, three, four, five tens. And an eight. How many? Five tens. Okay, you have a critical success there. No no doubt about that. So you're prepared for him to spit at you. You noticed from being close to him that he was probably going to shift into some kind of snake. And so the moment he starts shifting, you know what's coming. Uh, and so he spits venom at your face and you just sidestep and pounce on him. Uh, and you are grappling this massive eight-foot s- serpent in both hands. Yes. Uh, my my mm-hmm. goal is to wrap my arms around the basically mm-hmm. the base of his head um, mm-hmm. and then um, squeeze. Okay. Uh, so... You can, uh, so in that case, you're attempting, or not attempting because you succeeded, you're causing damage. Oh, yeah. So you're going to do some damage to him. So you got five tens, correct? Yeah, five tens and an eight. Okay, so you're going to do maximum damage to him here. He's going to take three points of aggravated damage. It's going to get worse than that. Because Marcus has three dots of potence, which means I add two additional damage on top of that. All right. So you do five aggravated damage to this serpent vampire. And he's suddenly not looking anywhere near as confident or as supercilious as he was, even in snake form. But he is thrashing about uh, in your grasp. Good luck getting out, buddy. Uh, and hissing. So the question is going to be is if he's uh, if his bodyguard hears things. So I'm going to roll for the mountain. Actually, one of my actions was to use silence. Well, before Marcus jumped on him, I was going to cloak us both and okay. then use silence. But since he jumped on him, it's now point in using cloak because he knows where he's at. Okay. Uh, it's probably a good thing to use. We'll say you act in tandem as Marcus leaps forward at Eli. Uh, you silence the room. Everything goes deathly, deathly quiet. And you feel fairly confident that the mountain outside couldn't hear anything. He's an idiot anyways. <laughs> he is. He's a meathead. Right. All right. So would you like to attempt to kill him. Oh, Marcus. Uh, I I don't want to kill him actually. No. So, all I want to do is literally choke him out and I want to do enough lethal um basically I w- I want to I want to suffocate him and I want to put him in torpor. I don't want to kill him. 
because technically speaking, uh, by the rules that we're all supposed to play by, we're not supposed to kill other vampires unless we are or, or are court ordered to essentially. And I'm not the sheriff, so I don't have that rule, but I can sure as fuck knock this guy out for a long time. And so that's my plan. Okay. So you are choking him out and he's going to attempt to break the grapple. Certainly. Um, so we're going to do another opposed check here. Mm -hmm. Strength versus strength. Strength versus strength. Okay. Only he's going to have a much uh, harder time of it because you've already dealt him severe damage. Yeah, I get to <laughs> add potence in as well. So mm -hmm. that uh, makes it difficult for him. Yeah, okay, so uh, 6, 6, 10, and uh, yeah, that'll about clean it up, so... Yeah, you you handily beat him in this in this contest, uh, and he struggles against your grip. You can feel the scales kind of rippling under your fingers. It's like he's trying to. It, it feels almost to you, Marcus, like he's trying to force himself back into his humanoid form, mm -hmm. uh, but he can't because he's been injured so badly. And you just tighten your grip and tighten your grip, uh, and you now have an unconscious serpent in your hands. I'd like to, by the end of it, I'd like to be looking back up at Alex while I choke the life out of, the unlife out of this gangrel. Yes. You're gripping so tightly as the serpent just sort of goes limp and you're looking up at Alex and Alex, Marcus's eyes look slightly red as he's doing this. And as you feel this snake go into unconsciousness, it shifts slowly back into the humanoid and now nude form of Eli. And you see your finger marks on his throat buried deep in the skin. And his eyes have rolled back in his head and he is unconscious for a very long time. I will drop silence. And uh, I will look over at uh, Marcus and tell him, I can call the car around. I know a back way out of here. I'm probably just a little, I guess, excited is probably the word I'd use. Well, sure. But uh, that's that's why Alex uses a calm, monotone <laughs> voice. I, uh, I look down at Eli and then look at you and say... Unless you're... I'm not much into snake of composure because I'm going to make sure that, um, you know, any, any further, <laughs> any further arousal, mm -hmm. uh, is, is tamped down a little bit because combat makes, I am going to ask for a composure role here because your, your blood is up. Yes. Your blood is up and, we need to see how well you're keeping things together because you just choked out a vampire, another vampire. And it was fantastic, I gotta tell you. I, I have a success, even down a die. All right, so... Thanks, Bruja. Yep, you're holding it together despite your blood pounding in your head and just the euphoria of successful combat. You're, you're still holding it together. Where there's, where there's one, Sabat, there are many. Well, sure, but... Um... Don't you think that a certain somebody who gave us this mission might want proof? Because if we have proof, because I'm assuming you're not going to kill him, because I would, that that would give you free reign to go take them all out as you see fit. Don't tell me you weren't in the war and I'm sure you want to get this under control before the hammer comes and just completely levels our city. Actually, I think the hammer is going to have a lot of hard times doing that. You've been in this city long enough to know it's people. Um, we don't like dictators. No, not at all. He's evidence as far as I'm concerned. But the problem with him is, is that he's, uh, well, he's slippery. Well, that's why we need to take him to the person that we need to take him to and let them decide what we get to do. We have proof and we can't just like hold on to him 
That fucker's not getting near my place. No, I'm sure you prefer the more docile and submissive ones. I, right? I'm into consent. So am I. So am I. That's why I won't kill him here. You, the door s- swings open and the mountain pokes his head in and says, five minutes up. I look at him dead in the eyes, still with the anger of, of ready to blood and combat and say, you're fired. Okay, give me some intimidate here. <laughs> and he's going to... Oh, can I help? Just that. Yeah, you can definitely help. <laughs> By looking scary behind him? Yep. Let, let's have some teamwork for once. <laughs> so, so we're ruling manipulation and intimidation. Mm-hmm. Yes. Two tens and three sixes. Okay. Nice. So between the two of you, like the mountain looks down at his boss, and then he looks at you... Uh, in your almost blood rage, Marcus, and then he looks at, and he looks like he's thinking maybe he can take you on, and then he sees Alex doing their creepy dead stare, and just goes, "This was a shitty job anyway." And he slams the door. So, Marcus and Alex, are you planning on taking Eli with you? Well, yeah, I would think so. Um, I'm gonna show. Marcus the back way out so we can get him out. Where are you taking him to? Well, that's what we were still discussing. Get a car pulled around and we'll I'll bag this asshole and we'll bring him where he needs to be. Yeah, I'll uh, call my driver and tell him when he pulls up to the back door to pop the trunk. Okay, so you pop the uh, pop the trunk or your driver pops the trunk and you can Uh, shove the unconscious Eli into the back with no issues. The mountain is nowhere to be seen. And the bartender just raises both eyebrows and he moves to block potential sight, uh, line of sight from other patrons of the club seeing you. And he's thank fuck. And I'm going to look at him and be like, I told you I've always got this place place's best interest in in heart. Uh-huh. Well, just say who boss is going to owe you a big one after this. Always. And he smiles and you can deposit Eli in the trunk and uh, as the trunk closes um, and Marcus, I assume you're going back to your own vehicle. Yeah, it's probably best. And your phone rings. Okay. Do I have any idea who it is? The caller ID says Gene. I pick it up. And Jean. you hear a frantic voice on the other end of the line. You have never heard the La Sombra Seneschal ever in a panic. She's calm and collected and cool, but she sounds stressed as fuck. And she's Marcus. Marcus, you there, Marcus? Yes, I'm here, Jean. What do you need? Have you heard? Have you heard? The announcement's about to go out. The blood hunt, Marcus. The prince is calling a blood hunt on Claudio. Hmm. It's... The moment the sun comes up, it goes out. If he's still in town, it's open season, Marcus. Yes, you am familiar with blood hunts. It's regrettable. He tried to kill the prince, Marcus. Then his life is forfeit. What what would you have me do? I, d- I don't know what's going on anymore, Marcus. He was he was in the inner circle, and he he's been here almost as long as I have, and he's and we and what's what's happening? What is happening in San Francisco, Marcus? The prince is is they're cracking, Marcus. They're cracking. I just, I just heard them a moment ago with your friend, Katerina, the Toreador. I didn't hear what they were saying, but the prince sounded like emotional, Marcus. Emotions. They don't do emotions. Perhaps there is a bit of stress given the fact that there are some very difficult things going on for us right now. Kindred are dying. Yes. We know that. And now some of us know why. Do you know what is happening? 
I, I feel like I, I can't protect the prince. I can't, I can't do anything. I don't know what's happening. And Claudio got in under my, under my nose. Are you near the theater? Yes. Good. Stay put. I'll be there shortly. I have a present for the prince. And with that, we will bring this session to a close. Thank you, everyone, for listening in on our coterie as they continue their adventures in San Francisco. We hope you will join us next time. Thank you and good night. Good night.